When I think of a near-perfect movie that not only has stood the test of time, but on a structural level, is far more polished and clever than it gets credit for. One of the first that comes to mind is in 1990, Ron Underwood directed Tremors. Be advised, however, there are two more, repeat, two more mother humpers. Easily, one of the best monster movies to ever get made, Tremors boasts the trifecta of genre movie making a tightly paced and smart script, a great cast of character actors, making even the most one-dimensional parts stick out, and of course, unique and cool practical effects. So today, let's head back to perfection and explore the dangers of what lies beneath the Nevada desert. This, my friends, is Tremors. Nice to hear it from you, Carlos. With somewhat of an underwhelming box office performance, debuting at number 5, Tremors, like Shawshank years later, found a second life in the aisles of the video store. Not to mention, it was on TBS, among other channels, uh, every week for, uh, like, my entire childhood. And that's why I'm here today. Tremors is a near masterpiece. And all this is because of the direction from Ron Underwood and screenplay by Brent Maddock and S.S. Wilson a genre mixer made of a charming small-town comedy and a western horror creature feature. See, Tremors walks a fine line and never wavers. This is a textbook example of knowing what you got and exactly where you are going. Tremors works because it's the epitome of a story with no fat on the bone. Opening shot, great matte painting by the way, establishes the open rule setting and the lifestyle of Val and Earl live. Just watching Val search for a smoke through empty pack after empty pack lets you know exactly who he is. And of course, him constantly missing the uh, nail for the barbed wire gives you kind of the quality of work they do. Brent Maddock and S.S. Wilson carve out a world where everything has a purpose and nothing is left to chance. But the most surprising thing is the tone that brings a sweetness to the eventual mayhem and how organic it feels. A quick journey down IMDb shows you why. They're responsible for the great short circuit and batteries not included. <laughs> Even f***ing Ghost Dad. Now, listen, I'm not saying that Ghost Dad is good, but, well, you know, a, a younger and more uh, stoned me I got a little enjoyment out of it. Put the bitch on the phone! Everything here is slyly set up. The cat in the trailer in the background, Mindy's love for the pogo stick, Chang's faulty cooler, or even Bert's prepper attitude. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is for the sake of plot convenience. There's a saying, keep it simple, stupid. And it's a guiding principle co-opted for writing, and Tremors does this with perfection. <laughs> Things move at a fast but reasonable pace, setting up the characters in town, then the monsters, and eventually the predicament of escape. All within an hour and 36 minutes. Listen, this baby ain't wasting time and we are better for it. What works in tandem with such a well-rounded script is the cast that brings the small town of perfection to life. There isn't a single wasted character. Nobody here could be excised without a domino effect. Everybody serves a purpose, and as rare as it is, shines through making each roll their own. Tony Gennaro's Miguel feels like a true salt-of-the-earth rancher, and his little interactions have a sense of sort of kindness and, and belonging. They wasn't making no noise. Why is he bothering them for? Of course, Michael Gross steals the show as the paranoid gun guy, but what I've always liked is that even if they kind of lightly use his paranoia for a bit of a laugh, they never make him out to be the goofy gun nut. Bert is fleshed out, caring and wise. Broke into the wrong goddamn rec room, didn't you, you bastard? I mean, hell, he even checks Melvin's gun once he gets it back, which he knew wasn't loaded because he follows the main rule of handling a gun. Always assume it's loaded once you take your eyes off of it. All guns are always loaded. Finn Carter's Rhonda has the sweet and innocent charm and holds her own against Bacon and Ward, which should be noted. I mean, Carter is an important piece here, and she gives Rhonda a lot of heart. We run like goddamn bastards. Uh, pardon my friend. While Wong as the shopkeep is always trying to make a buck and keep the town going. Now, of course, this is Bacon and Ward's show. Jet Pellance was actually supposed to be Earl in the early draft, but, um, you know, honestly, I'd love to see what that would look like in a weird universe. But they made the better choice here. Bacon and Ward have some of the best 
in chemistry in film. Pardon my French. Honestly, I'd put them in the same league as Gibson and Glover or Murphy and Nolte. Bacon has that youthful energy that is captivating. I mean, there's a screen presence here that cannot be denied. Is bickering between who made breakfast? The hell you did? Bologna and beans. Uh, yeah, the opening, fake stampede. I mean, there is something here that can't just be replicated by switching out the actor. And shows a sort of minute level of acting, and honestly is the reason he's the star he is. But as I've grown older, I relate more to Earl. And find Fred Ward, the master at hand here. I mean, are we asking too much of life? I mean, his little expressions and how he emotes in every situation is brilliant. Yes, brilliant. Kevin Bacon may have the energy as Val. Michael Gross may steal the movie with his straight yet humorous portrayal as Bert. But listen up. Fred Ward carries every scene. Just watch him. Trust me. And all this is built around a unique and grounded monster. One for the ages, the Graboid. Created by Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. of Amalgamated Dynamics, Tremors delivers on the monster front with such precision that I put its design alongside classics like the Blob or the Xenomorph from Alien. I mean, this thing is a beauty and it takes a level of skill and balls, brass balls to be specific, to take your monster and put it in such bright, direct light. There is no hiding here. It is out in the forefront for all to see. And the best decision was showing the tongued creature first with the massive reveal later on. It's a fantastic design that has a realistic yet sort of out of this world look. And well, yeah, I'm about to be the uh, old man that yells at Cloud, but everything is practical. And so even being fake, it interacts with the dry desert world it's in. I am not there, but I feel this thing. I understand it, it makes sense. And that's the thing about practical effects, when even the best CGI comes around. I will f***ing take this worm, this graboid, over anything in Avatar. This will always be better than anything created digitally. That I love. I absolutely love. Amalgamated Dynamics understood the assignment and created something that 30 plus years later holds up like the day it came out. It stands the test of time. God damn bitch. Pardon my French. Shit. The reason Tremors means so much to me is that it exemplifies a style of movie that doesn't really exist anymore. Not with this type of tone and backing. Tremors is an adventure movie with a flavor of Raiders of the Lost Ark mixed with a 50s monster movie, scored with Ernest Troost's zestful western harmonics and Robert Folk's darker sounds. Tremors is a movie that bucks the trends of the genre it's in. I mean, it's filmed mostly outside, in the warm sun. This is a monster flick that isn't going for the usual tropes. It's a story of friendship, community, guns, and cigarettes. And it never talks down or pokes fun of its own. There's a, a warmth and respect to this Western adventure that has always stuck with me. And yes, not everything from script to screen stayed the same. Characters were removed, situations altered and added. And we even get one of the rare times where a test screening changes something for the better. Because in the alternate ending, Val turns around to go back to Rhonda. But they needed to kiss, they absolutely needed to kiss, and I am 100% on board because there is something special. When the music hits, he goes in for the kiss and it dallies up. It is just an ending for the ages here and cements this with that soulful feeling. Tremors is an absolute classic that is backed up with good writing, stylish directing, and a cast that breathes life into the smallest of characters. I miss these type of adventures, but to look on it this many years later brings me a, a deep joy. This will always exist. Tremors will never go away, but I was lucky enough to have it in my rotation in the formative years of my education of cinema. And I'll never take that for granted. Thank you to everybody involved for giving me one of the building blocks of my youth. What comes to mind when you think of some of the best sequels of all time? I'm sure most of you would say The Empire Strikes Back, The Godfather Part 2, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, or even Paddington 2. Paddington 2 is incredible. 
Told you. Sometimes these sequels have huge production issues, run into delays, and barely make it to the finish line. I'm looking at you, No Time to Die. Okay. Some films lose a good chunk of their progress and have to almost start over. Toy Story 2, anyone? Okay, I'm officially freaked out now. Well, I've got one better for you. Ever heard of Tremors 2 Aftershock? You know, that sequel to Tremors which had the unfortunate demise of being released direct to video? Yep, I said that right, direct to video release. Have you ever wondered why the film's distributor, Universal, didn't push for a wide release into theaters? Look, no way, not for any amount of money. Well, let's strap in and pop open a cold one as we find out WTF happened to Tremors 2. Before we can begin talking about the sequel, we need to talk about the first film, aptly named Tremors. What? Why do you think I drove all this way? It was released on January 19th, 1990, and was well received by both critics and audiences alike. Over the years, it has gained a cult following. The premise revolves around two repairmen, Val McKee, played by Kevin Bacon, and Earl Bassett, played by Fred Ward. They are both tired of their lives in a small town located in Nevada and decide to leave. On their way out, they stumble upon a series of mysterious deaths and link up with a concerned seismologist, played by Finn Carter, as well as an eccentric survivalist couple, Bert and Heather Gummer, who are played by Michael Gross and Reba McIntyre. They all discover some unnatural readings under the ground. These readings turn out to be giant worm-like monsters who are hungry for humans. Since these worms don't have an actual name, our ragtag group of heroes come up with the term Graboids. We then see the group take down the worms and save the town. Everyone ends up happy and we roll credits. Upon release, the film went from having an R to PG rating. This made the screenwriters happy because Tremors would appeal to a more family-friendly audience. You know, take your kids to watch worms pop out of the ground and eat people. The next perfect family film. Its budget was $10 million and went on to gross over $16 million at the box office. It was a small hit, but not as big as Universal had hoped for. Once released on home video, it gained more success, and even more people got to enjoy this worm-hunting, feel-good film of the year. It has even spawned multiple home video releases, including a great-looking 4K disc from Arrow Video. And hey, what you gonna do with all your money? Invest it. Well, yeah, of course invest it, but even at 5%, I'll be doing pretty good. When time came for a sequel, everyone was on board. Well, but almost everyone. The spot it! It's coming right toward us! Well, that's the idea! Yeah, I know that's the idea. Doesn't mean I have to like it. Let's stop! Stop already, will ya? Tremors 2 Aftershocks started production in 1993 when MCA Universal took interest in the script. Screenwriters Brent Maddock and S.S. Wilson, who penned the first film, came back to write the sequel. These two wrote some great 80s films, including Short Circuit 1 and 2, as well as Batteries Not Included. Let's also not forget that they were story consultants on the first Land Before Time and wrote the script for Ghost Dad, which is a film that we'd like to pretend doesn't exist. Put the bitch on the phone! Put the bitch on the phone! S.S. Wilson wanted to try his hand at directing Tremors 2. With full approval from the studio, he rolled up his sleeves and manned the helm. The film was going to be shot in Australia with a budget of $17 million, with the proposed idea that Kevin Bacon and Reba McIntyre would return to play their beloved characters. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case here. But how could that be? I was just talking to her. Reba declined because she was on tour for her music career, and Kevin was very interested in the script, but had to bow out due to prior commitments for Ron Howard's upcoming space epic, Apollo 13. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Fred Ward returned as Earl Bassett, as well as Michael Gross for the role of Burt Gummer, who was the heart and soul of this movie. Had the bullets custom cast from solid bronze. <laughs> Man, Bert, you put a whole new shine on the word overkill. When you need it and don't have it, you sing a different tune. Yeah. We were also introduced to newcomers Grady Hoover, played by Christopher Garton, Dr. Kate Riley, played by Helen Shaver, and Carlos Ortega, played by Marcelo Tuber. Each character plays an essential part in making the story flow, with Grady making the biggest dent and becoming one of the most likable characters in the Tremors series. 
These hills are alluvial. Oh, alluvial. Wait, but that's that little uh, dingleberry in the back of your throat, right? Unfortunately, Kate isn't written with much depth. Besides being a geologist, she also posed as a Playboy model, which Earl remembers quite well. This October 1974. Yeah, she's there to remind me not to keep chasing after things I'm never going to get. October 74? Shit. <laughs> Carlos Ortega is the catalyst to getting the movie going and convinces Earl to come to Mexico and hunt some graboids. The movie picks up sometime after the first Tremors. Earl has invested his money for the previous film in an ostrich ranch, which sounds like a great way to waste your earnings. Now you and Susie are gonna make me some little birds or I'm gonna take some barbecue sauce to both of you. He is approached by Carlos Ortega, who asks him to come and hunt graboids in Mexico. They are destroying his oil field and killing his workers. Before Earl can decline, Carlos's taxi driver, Grady, convinces him that he will be paid handsomely for capture or killing the attacking worms. Earl agrees, and we're off to Mexico! Once there, Earl meets Kate, who's a geologist studying the worms. Earl takes a liking to Grady, and the two go off with some remote-controlled cars that are rigged with explosives. They use these to blow up the worms. After killing off a good amount of graboids, the boys are outnumbered by the increasing amount of worms. Earl enlists the help of Bert Gummer from the previous movie. Bert is all hung up on Heather, who left him, and Earl convinces him to head on down to Mexico. Once there, Bert not only provides all the ammunition they need to outsmart the worms, but he also has a truck rigged with explosives. Can I just say that Bert truly is the best character in this film? He not only has the best lines, I am completely out of ammo, but is the most likable overall, and you can't help but root for him. Oh, I'm just dandy. <laughs> So what do we do now? While Bert carries the rest of the film, the boys eventually take notice that the Graboids have evolved, but with legs. They are of course smaller, deadlier, and blind, and can track your body heat with a special infrared receptor on their head. It almost sounds like John Krasinski took some of those ideas and added to his playbook for A Quiet Place. But anyways, the Graboids 2.0, aka Shriekers, are bipedal like creatures that are eating up radios, cars, and anything with a heat signature on them, especially people. They destroy almost every mode of transportation and make it increasingly difficult for Earl and Grady to return to base. Eventually, Earl and the gang make it back to the oil facility. Kate explains how the worms are hermaphrodites and replicate fast after eating Bert's frozen food, which he left lying around around his truck. They lure all the Shriekers into a building and Earl throws some explosives at the creatures. This causes the building and everything surrounding it to blow up. Don't worry though, because our characters make it out in the nick of time. During the aftermath, Earl pursues Kate and discusses their future. Grady suggests opening an amusement park, something of a running gag throughout the film. My one question though is did they ever get their money for killing the Graboids and Shriekers? You know Grady? Some people think I'm overprepared, paranoid, maybe even a little crazy. But they never met any Precambrian life forms, did they? The movie was actually filmed in Valencia, California. Because of our biggest stars departing to film before production, MCA Universal cut back on shooting locations as well as the budget. It went from $17 million to a deflated $4 million. Filming took a total of 27 days in early 1994, and honestly, looks pretty great. There were tons of cool added features to this film. First and foremost are the new Graboids. In the first film, the worms were coming from the ground up. No props were needed to show them above ground. That is, until now. The creature design team, Amalgamated Dynamics, was faced with this new challenge of showing the Shriekers walking and running around. The team would create some fantastic prosthetic puppets, including fully articulated puppets, which required 16 puppeteers to operate. In the case of showing a shrieker bombing up, shot, or dropped, a dummy was used in place. 
Since some of the practical effects couldn't be shot on camera, like walking, running, or climbing, the Post team called up Tippett Studios, yes, Mr. Phil Tippett himself, to create the CGI movement of the creatures. To give the look of the infrared view from the Shriekers perspective, the actors wore red suits and yellow stockings. The crew shot these scenes in high 8 videotape and were blown up to 35mm film. It would give the shots that grainy feel. The post-production team would then render their faces and bodies into different colors. Hey, it was the 90s. You didn't have free, easy plugins like you do today. You know, as I lie here, I can't help but comment. After the film was finished, it was time for the test audiences to view it in all its graboid glory. To Universal's surprise, the test screenings went over it unanimously well. They couldn't get enough of Earl's MacGyvering in any tense situation, one in particular involving hanging iron clothes to avoid being detected by shriekers. MCA Universal, shocked beyond all belief, were unsure about how to distribute the film, so they did what any smart company would do and shelve the project for the next two years. They deemed a theatrical release to be too expensive and didn't believe in this film appealing to the general public. You know, she actually blames our problems on the collapse of the Soviet Union. Well, you did take that kind of hard, Bert. During this time, the creators would petition that it get a theatrical wide release. MCA Universal finally gave in and set a planned release date for April 9th, 1996, which was exactly two years after the film was completed. The only problem was it received a very limited screening in theaters. The studio thought it would be better to distribute this as a direct-to-video release, both the theatrical and home video release would coincide on the same day, and then on Laserdisc, April 16th. It wouldn't find its high-definition home video release until 2021. I don't like it, Grady. They're getting smarter. That's what they do. They got some kind of plan going here. Once everything was said and done, everyone moved on to different projects. Fred Ward had great parts in classic comedies such as Road Trip and Joe Dirt. Hey, how exactly is a rainbow made? How exactly does the sun set? How exactly does the positive track rear end on a Plymouth work? It just does. It just does. Michael Gross went on to reprise his role multiple times, in fact, as Burt Gummer in the other direct-to-home video Tremor sequels. Christopher Garden would appear in some big films such as Flight Plan and Black Swan, while Helen Shaver went on to have roles in some smaller films and even appeared in a true 90s classic, The Craft. S.S. Wilson only ever directed one other movie, Tremors 4, The Legend Begins, and is considered better than Tremors 3, Back to Perfection. That's also the only sequel where Michael Gross didn't return as Bert. Well, we're sorry, Bert. I mean, they just changed all of a sudden, man. Both S.S. Wilson and Brent Maddock stayed on as a scriptwriting duo and wrote both Tremors 3 and 4, as well as the infamous 90s bomb, Wild Wild West. They have some explaining to do regarding Dr. Loveless, but that's a story for another time. Mick Casa, I sue Casa. That comes shivu. Let the party begin! For some of us kids who grew up in the 90s, we would have our luck of seeing some of the Tremors films appear on the Sci-Fi Channel. I can easily say I remember watching this multiple times and having fond memories watching those graboids blow up after digesting the remote controlled cars. I've always loved the 90s look and feel of it all, especially the CRT TVs that were used to track the graboids. Hell, Earl even has his own arcade game in the beginning. Oh my god, you got your own one of these! Oh, I bet you made a fortune off this. Quarter, 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 quarter. No, well, somebody did. Sure wasn't me. Watching this now, in its pristine high-def transfer, I'd say the film has never looked better. It has a certain quality of pure popcorn fun that so deserved a theatrical release. I'm going to rate this an 8 out of 10. It still maintains the charm and fun that the first Tremors displayed. It's quick, has a simple enough story to follow, and dives deeper into Graboid's lore. Most importantly, those practical effects and puppets still hold up well. I'd even go as far to say Earl is better here than in the original. He seems more on the ball and ready to take on any challenge thrown at him, whether it's ostriches, people, or shriekers. He's ready. Now move with me. Move? It's gonna work, damn it! Now move! If you haven't seen this great follow-up sequel, 
I didn't know. How could I have known? I'd say it's time to find yourself a copy on a streaming service platform. If you want a physical copy with high definition video and sound, I suggest looking for the Blu-ray. And if you really want to feed your nostalgia craze, look for a VHS tape or laser disc, if you even have one. Maybe one day, someone crazy enough, hopefully an Alamo draft house, will hold some screenings for this film and will finally get the proper release it so deserves. Hey, that's right, that's right, we didn't die. <laughs> Although, we did kind of blow up their refinery. Hey, that's just part of the job. In fact, we ought to charge him for all those little ones, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. But Maddock had a lot of monsters to bring to the screen, and this was the most efficient way to get it done. And people call me paranoid. Uh, I don't think you're paranoid. I do. In the Seekin Perfection book, Maddock confirms that Tremors 3 was a difficult movie to make. Subterranean creatures become two-legged, gliding ass blasters in the second sequel to Tremors. Kevin Bacon isn't there to fight them, neither is Fred Ward, but Michael Gross is still around and ready to save the day. In a movie that didn't quite have enough money or time to bring its monster action to the screen, today we're talking about Tremors 3 back to perfection, and we're going to find out what the fuck happened to this horror movie. Directed by Ron Underwood from a script he crafted with Brent Maddock and S.S. Wilson, the 1990 film Tremors is one of the greatest creature features ever made. It took viewers to the tiny desert town of perfection, Nevada, and introduced us to some endearing, perfectly cast characters. There was Michael Gross as heavily armed survivalist Burt Gummer. Country singer Reba McIntyre is Burt's wife Heather. Bobby Jacoby as annoying teenager Melvin Plug. Charlotte Stewart as artist Nancy, and Ariana Richards as her daughter Mindy, Tony Gennaro as Rancher Miguel, Victor Wong as store owner Walter Chang, Finn Carter as geology grad student Rhonda Lebeck, and some others who end up a hot lunch for monsters. Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward played handyman Val McKee and Earl Bassett, who decide to get out of perfection just one day too late, because now they're trapped in the valley by a bunch of subterranean creatures. Things called graboids, which move quickly through the dirt and hunt prey on the surface by sound. Rising from the ground, they unravel tentacle tongues that grab their victims and pull them in. Thus the name graboids. With the help of their neighbours, Val and Earl were able to defeat the monsters. Tremors wasn't a box office success, but it was enough of a hit on home video that Universal greenlit a sequel. Underwood was busy directing other projects, but Universal did bring Maddock, Wilson and their company Stampede Entertainment back for the follow-up. They were told Tremors 2 would get a theatrical release if Kevin Bacon and Reba McIntyre were in the cast. So Maddock and Wilson initially wrote a story that would have Val, Earl, Bert and Heather hunting Graboids in Australia. And to keep things fresh, they threw in a twist. The reveal that if Graboids were around long enough, they were metamorphous, splitting open with two-legged, heat-seeking creatures emerging from their bodies. These things are called shriekers, due to the sound they make when they spot something they want to eat. Unfortunately, a Tremors sequel wasn't on Bacon's agenda, and McIntyre was too busy with her music career. So, plans changed. Tremors 2 became a director video project with a lower budget. Val and Heather were written out, and the setting moved from Australia to Mexico. But it was still about Earl and Bert going to a different country to hunt graboids, and being surprised by the existence of shriekers. In place of Val, Earl got a new sidekick, cab driver Grady Hoover, played by Christopher Garton. Once again, a Tremors movie had great success on home video, and well deserved, since Tremors 2 is one of the best director video sequels ever made. After going over the numbers, Universal decided to order another sequel from Stampede Entertainment, but they weren't going to make it a smooth ride for them. The first Tremors had a budget of at least 11 million and an initial shooting schedule of 54 days. The budget dropped to 3 million for part 2, which was filmed in 27 days. Stampede had done so well with these limitations, Universal cut back a little more on Tremors 3. Now they were going to see what they could do with a budget of 2 million and a shooting schedule of 22 days. This one was going to be a challenge. 
but writers Maddock and Wilson and producer Nancy Roberts didn't let that stifle their creativity. Universal told them this was going to be the last Tremors movie, wrap it up as a trilogy. So they came up with a story that would take viewers back to the setting of the first movie, Perfection Nevada, and would reveal the final stage in the Graboid life cycle. Tremors 3 was going to deliver three variations of the monster on a budget less than one-fifth of what the first movie had. Universal announced Tremors 3 in August of 2000. Filming would begin in October, and they were aiming for October 2001 release. The project was moving fast. So fast that Maddock and Wilson decided to bring in someone else to write the screenplay. Based on their outline, their choice was John Welpley, who had been writing for television since the 1970s, and happened to be a client of Roberts at her talent agency. Roberts supervised as Welpley wrote the script, making sure he captured the right tone. It needed humour and irreverence. These movies were never meant to be dark. They were sort of creature features that the whole family could enjoy. But Welpley was also very busy himself because he was a writer and story editor on the show Earth Final Conflict. That series took up so much of his time and energy, he nearly missed his deadline for writing the Tremors 3 script. He told Jonathan Melville, author of the Tremors franchise guide Seeking Perfection, that he had to spend the last five days writing fast and going without sleep. Thankfully, the script turned out well enough. And then Maddock and Wilson did their own revisions, with rewrites continuing throughout production. Since Wilson had directed part two, it was decided that Maddock would direct part three, and he hired the same cinematographer that had worked on the previous two films, Virgil Harbour, ensuring this one would still have that Tremors look. Since the budget was so low, they couldn't afford to recreate perfection where it had been built the first time, in Lone Pine, California, 200 miles away from Los Angeles. This time the town was going to be built in the Los Angeles area. In fact, some scenes were shot right by Six Flags Magic Mountain, the supposedly isolated town of perfection was built so close to a freeway it caused sound problems that had to be fixed in post-production. Cast and crew had to stay in Long Pine during the filming of the first movie. This time they could go back to their own homes at the end of every shooting day and drive themselves to work the next day. Several of the actors had already been cast in their roles 11 years earlier. Most of the people who survived the events of the first film are still living in perfection. Charlotte Stewart is back as Nancy, Ariana Richards was going to college at the time, but her teachers let her take work home with her so she could play Mindy again. Bobby Jacoby, now credited as Robert Jane, reprises the role of Melvin. And the annoying teen has become an annoying man. Now he's into real estate, wanting to demolish perfection and replace it with a bunch of ranchettes. Tony Gennaro returned as Miguel, notably absent are Valentin McKee and Earl Bassett. Kevin Bacon had turned down Tremors 2, so it was correctly assumed that he wouldn't be interested in Tremors 3. But since Earl isn't in this movie, there's a misconception that Fred Ward also turned down an offer to return. The fact is, there never was an offer. Earl was never going to be in the script. Maddock and Wilson wanted to stay true to the character. He had always wanted to leave perfection. He made a lot of money in Tremors 2, and that was his ticket out. He wouldn't still be there for this one. From the beginning, the plan was to make Michael Gross and his character Burt Gummer the lead in part 3. Gross hadn't been too thrilled with the setup of part 2, where the characters go to Mexico to protect an oil field from graboids. Because, as he said, who cares about oil people? He was happy that 3 was going back to perfection. He said, To me, the standard was the first film where you had men, women and children. You had an ersatz community, a family of sorts, whether they were related by blood or not. That was, I felt, the chemistry that always worked best for Bert. Newcomers to the franchise include Sean Christian, who overcame Bride of Chucky's Nick Stabile and Sleepwalker's Brian Krause to win the role of Desert Jack Sawyer. Perfection has become a tourist destination. People want to see the place where the Graboids were, and Jack is cashing in on that by giving people tours around town where he fakes a Graboid attack. With Billy Ryak playing his ill-fated accomplice Buford, also cashing in on Graboids and Shriekers is Jody Chang, who now runs Chang's Market, inherited from her late uncle, and has filled it with memorabilia. Uncle Walter would be proud. Susan Chuan got the role when the filmmakers saw footage of her cracking up the stars of the show Dharma and Greg during a guest appearance. When Graboids surface again in perfection, disrupting Jack's tour with a real attack, three government agents come riding in. They're played by Tom Everett, Barry Livingston, and John Pappas. Pappas had already played a road worker who gets eaten by the Graboids in the first movie, but that didn't stop him from being cast in part three. The government agents inform the residents of perfection that Graboids and Shriekers have been classified as an endangered species, and therefore cannot be hunted or killed. 
They're hoping to be able to trap a graboid and transport it to a safe location. If that's not possible, the Perfection residents might have to give up their homes so these creatures can roam free in the area. Bert is bummed that he can't just wipe out these graboids, but in an effort to save his town, he tries to help the government men capture one of them. This doesn't go well for him, and when a graboid reaches the Shrieker phase of its life cycle, it doesn't go well for the agents. Bert, who mows down Shriekers in Argentina in the opening scene, is now ready to take care of Perfection's Shrieker problem. But there's still a graboid around, a sterile albino graboid that won't metamorphose. Miguel names it El Blanco, and El Blanco slows Bert down enough that the Shriekers have time to metamorphose as well. Turning into the third and final stage of the life cycle, creatures that Jody names Ass Blasters. This is because these two-legged creatures mix flammable chemicals in their rear ends. These fiery chemicals blast them off the ground, so they can glide through the air. Ass Blasters lay eggs that hatch graboids. Now we know how every step of the life cycle works for these prehistoric creatures. Tom Woodruff Jr. and Alec Gillis designed the graboids for Tremors, and the Shriekers for Tremors too. They returned to design the Ass Blasters as well drawing inspiration from Bombardier beetles, which eject a hot chemical spray from their abdomen, accompanied by a popping sound, a way to scare off predators. Woodruff and Gillis wanted to bring the ass blasters to the screen primarily through rod puppetry, but there have been some CGI creatures in Tremors too, and the filmmakers decided to increase the amount of CGI this time. Himani Productions was brought in to handle the computer effects. The budget allowed for 40 shots of CG creatures, but the movie needed more like 80 shots, so, visual effects artists Kevin Kachava and Linda Drake made extra shots for free on their own time, because they wanted to be able to show what they were capable of. Tremors 3 would be their calling card. The CG effects don't all hold up more than 20 years later. Some of them didn't even look so good in 2001, but Maddock had a lot of monsters to bring to the screen, and this was the most efficient way to get it done. Welpley has admitted that one issue he had when writing the script is that he tends to ramble on with his dialogue but pacing is very important for a creature feature, so he had to try not to be too wordy. Maddock and Wilson whittled down the dialogue in their revisions. Still, the finished film does have pacing problems and a whole lot of talking. There are several moments where the movie seems to be building up to an action sequence. Then the characters get interrupted and the energy sputters out. Bert is going to go graboid hunting, then he's stopped by the government agents. He and his cohorts are going to kill the Shriekers, but El Blanco stops them. And instead of getting action, we get several more minutes of dialogue. It's necessary for the story that a certain amount of time go by without monsters getting killed. The Graboids have to turn into Shriekers, which then have to turn into Ass Blasters. This takes time, but the way it could have been a bit more exciting. Things could have been sped up a little. The dialogue could have been cut down by some more. At almost 104 minutes, Tremors 3 is around 7 minutes longer than the previous films and would have been better off if it were closer to their running times. That said, it's always nice to hang out with Bert and his pals in perfection, and the movie does have some good action sequences. The Shrieker encounter in Argentina, Bert being swallowed by a Graboid, and surviving, and when the Ass Blasters arrive, it really picks up. Dealing with Ass Blasters is a lot different than dealing with Graboids, or with Shriekers, and it's fun to watch Bert figure out how to battle this new type of monster. In the Seeking Perfection book, Maddock confirms that Tremors 3 was a difficult movie to make. He said, It's one of those things when you're in the middle of it, saying, This script is just too elaborate. What were they thinking? Today we're shooting a scene where the flying creatures land on this thing, and this thing blows up and they're rolling down a mountain. Who wrote this? You begin to hate yourself. But he's satisfied with how it all turned out. He told the book's author, I think Tremors 3 is the greatest movie about giant underground creatures that turn into flying creatures I've ever seen. That was a very challenging movie. We shot it in 22 days, which is way, way too fast. But I had a really great crew and there's a lot of stuff I'm really proud of, especially doing it under duress with as little time and money as we did. Universal saved money by doing as little promotion as possible for Tremors 3, figuring that something with the title Tremors sells itself. And they were right. When the film reached DVD and VHS in October of 2001, it surpassed all sales predictions. And when it aired on the Sci-Fi Channel, it got the second highest ratings in the network's history, only coming in behind Sci-Fi's own Dune miniseries. Michael Gross was nominated for Best Actor in a DVD and VHS film release at the Video Premier Awards. His competition included Jean-Claude Van Damme in Replicant, 
Adam Baldwin in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, his feature Tremors TV series co-star Christopher Lloyd in When Good Ghouls Go Bad, and his former Tremors co-star Fred Ward in Full Disclosure. Gross and Ward both attended the ceremony, and Gross won the award. Tremors 3 has its ups and downs. It didn't come out quite as well as the previous two movies. It was more difficult to make than its predecessors, but it's an entertaining monster movie, and it was a big success for Universal, opening the door to more Tremors projects and giving Michael Gross a lot more chances to fight Graboids, Shriekers, and Ass Blasters. 